If you haven't figured it out by now, this channel is all about indie games. Sure, I like a triple A game now and again, but I find indie games the most fascinating. I find that in the end, most of them take the bigger risks, try something new, or just have the most passion in them when it comes to a particular element. There's no design by committee in a lot of these cases. And sure, indie games have flaws, and may not have some polish as some games with larger studios behind them can have, but I find that when it comes to something that truly captivates me in the gaming space, and captures that joy of me gaming when I was younger, it's more than likely an indie game that does that nowadays. The Never Awakes, The Wonder Songs, even the non-AAA yet bigger titles like Danganronpa, all of them have something that keep me coming back to them over and over again. And thus, I play a lot of them, and buy a lot of them out of my own pocket. You can see me stream two or three new indie games a week over on my Twitch channel, because God knows their recommendations and YouTube doesn't seem to like streaming and content over here. And in that time, I play a variety of different genres and quality games. But of course, I can't review them all. And sometimes, I don't even get to write a Steam review for most of the games I play. I just go on to the next one and sort of forget about it. Which is sad because sometimes I really should be writing them. Well today, inspired by a certain comment left on a post on this channel, along with some inspiration from other creators such as Super Bunny Hop and Cub Like Foot, I want to highlight some of the games that I played since the start of the year that I think may be worth your time, but in a shotgun form of mini reviews. Granted, these are all based on my first impressions of the game after anywhere from 2-10 to 10 hours of gameplay, and games that I haven't fully reviewed already. If you like this format, let me know in the comment section below. But I've already done this intro a little bit long, so let's get started. One genre of game that I cover less often than I'd like to on this channel is simulation and farming type games. The fact of the matter is, they take a lot of effort to review in my system due to the sheer amount of content and different pathways that you can come across. It doesn't help that I'm always afraid of getting addicted to those games despite it not being one of my favorite genres because of my personality type and well, I like to do all the things. While I've done my best to avoid going back to it an unhealthy amount, Dragonoka still sits in my library daily taunting me to keep building and exploring. So what you see in the footage here is a building and simulation type game, but you have a lot of elements that you have to deal with here. You have to manually gather resources by using tools or your hands, and then build the items you need to get the next section of upgrades or materials. But you also have to build homes, including roofs and floors, and designing homes the way you want around the environment. This is needed to invite new people to the place, which are now residents that will unlock new elements and will help you succeed in building more things and even having affection levels that you can cultivate. Oh, and the place that you do this on? Oh, it's not a planet or a village. It's on the back of a dragon, which has other dragons in the world that could affect your dragon if it's in range. Also, monsters can attack you and your dragon. Also, you need to feed your dragon and your people. There's a lot to this game and it's not a game for anyone that doesn't want to manage things because it leaves it to you and you only to take care of things. The world is not gonna succeed without your help. And at first, it's extremely daunting and almost to the point where it feels like it's patronizing. The control scheme can be a little tough to get adjusted to, as it's a little bit atypical for the keyboard controls that I say are more standard in games like this. And the game seems to have hundreds of stats and items to use and things to combine. It doesn't help at first that this fairy lady keeps on appearing at the side of the screen, ringing a bell when you level up skills, and in fact, for some, it may drive you insane.
But ultimately, it's those little nuances and those atypical elements that still feel familiar, yet have a twist on them that makes Dragonoka a game that you want to come back to. There's wise implementation on the simplest of things, like gathering resources. Most games nowadays, you hold down a button if you want to gather things for a period of time or want to hit things multiple times. But Dragonoka has a twist on that. You can be more effective in gathering things if you hit your resource at a rhythm, which is specific to each material. So that knowledge of what beat to gather on is important. And while yes, you may not know exactly how to start the beat at times, it does reward you for that knowledge and can be vital in not wasting time and energy, especially early on in the game. There's moments where all of a sudden, one of your residents are sick, and the game has taught you nothing at this point about how to make medicine. It's then trying to figure out, wait, how do I get medicine? As you run around looking for the right ingredients and building areas, hoping to God that you can figure it out before something bad happens. In those moments, it's surprising how much the game shines, as you start to see that maybe you should have paid more attention to gathering certain flowers or upgrading the paths that you needed. It's not brutal in terms of punishing you in most of the cases, but does enough where at that moment, you're really feeling like the elder of a village that is trying everything in their power to keep everyone alive. And look, the game isn't a looker. It does feel like an RPG maker game, despite it seeming to have different menus and a bit of a different interface. The story is there at times, with the whole calamity of what happened and the people you came across, but it's sort of in the background a lot of the time. Don't get me wrong, there's obvious passion in every element here, and it comes across in portraits and even things like the zoom out animation to the dragon you're riding. But why it ends up in this video is simple. It brought me back to a time when I first played games like Harvest Moon, like Civilization, like Age of Empires. We're learning about how to do things and take advantage of things and being surprised by something strange happening. It brought me the sense of nostalgia that some more polished and marketable games can't do to me nowadays. It seems to put a real emphasis on doing things by yourself and figuring it out. And in the gaming landscape, where it feels like the player is being handheld every single moment, that really resonated with me. It's definitely not for everyone. It's for the hardcore simulation players out there. But even those other players may want to take a look at Dragon Noka, because it's also got this odd charm that makes me want to stop this video and go play it more. I mean, I was coming up with excuses to get more footage. You know a game has got something going on when it's doing that to you. Next up, on the surface, you may see Glimmer in Mirror and be reminded of games like Ori and the Blind Forest, Dust and Elysian Tale, and other world-exploring metrovanias with cute and cartoonish main characters. You'll be blown away by the beauty of these environments, especially for the team that was present here. It's not a big one. There are character designs with hair flowing in the wind that will just keep you in awe, and monsters that feel familiar, yet have their own element of uniqueness to them in the genre. Glimmer and Mirror is a game about beauty in a lot of forms, and yet still is able to keep me entertained from a metroidvania gameplay perspective. From the get-go, you need to know that this is an early access game, but don't consider that to indicate a game without polish. Quite frankly, despite others seemingly having some bugs and problems, I didn't run into any bugs of any sort. But what it looks like is happening is that the two artists and one programmer yes, three people made the game that you see on screen, which is sort of impressive, are trying to get information from the community on how to refine the game's design, which is interesting. 
The thing is, quite frankly, a lot of different opinions will come out of some of the choices that the game has structurally made. And I'm not sure how well they're going to be able to use feedback without major design changes in a good amount of the cases. I see reviews mentioning the jump heights, for example, and recommendations to change it to some of the best games in the genre. And the funny thing is, is that part of what I like about Glimmer in Mirror is that it's a little different from other games in the genre and gives me the reason to play it because of that. I like that the jumping is focused on horizontal movement because jumps have a preset height. You don't get more air by holding the jump button or a little air by just tapping it. The thing is, for a melee focused combat game, that would be an issue. But this is more of a Metroid or a Mega Man than a Castlevania, as our weapon is a projectile based weapon. You don't have to specifically land in a certain spot in order to hit the enemy, you just have to be in the right area in terms of verticality, and that's all about timing and putting yourself in the right position, and I like that. The boss fights, for example, are difficult and you will die several times, but you learn little by little and make micro adjustments to hit the boss and make progress really focusing on how to approach the enemy rather than a series of combos or dramatic movements. I see people recommending that they add a dodge button, and honestly, I find this more intelligent combat than one focusing on majorly dodging left and right over and over again in a hyper action-y type game. I love the mystery of the story about the witch and our failing memory, and how we connect with our crown partner. I think the developers made wise choices in complementing that, like not being too specific with the map, leaving you like your character, confused, yet it feels appropriate. Granted, I would like to see some way of marking the map so the player can gather the information in question, but that's the key element I want to leave with you in terms of this mini review. I find the game's gameplay, its presentation, its sound, its overall elements may not necessarily be the best in the world in terms of the gameplay element, but it complements the feelings of the story very well and feels very in tune with the game's themes. This feels like it was constructed from the ground up in one specific way and I hope the developers keep their vision in terms of what they want the game to become, not necessarily listening to everyone out there. Hell, part of the reason I want to link this part in terms of my Steam review is to tell the developers, hey, keep at it, keep refining what you have, and don't overhaul things too horribly. Because what's here is pretty great, and I want to see more of this story. I want to see more of this. I don't want to see Hollow Knight 2.0. Okay, yes, I do want to see Hollow Knight 2.0, but I don't want to see it here. I want to see Glimmer in Mirror. Moving on. Look, shmups are vastly overlooked nowadays. That's just the fact. The sad part is, is that in today's time-based return on games, Shmups on the surface seem to be a low value. You could beat the game in 90 minutes, which is incredibly not true. Shmups replayability and different paths and way to deal with hazards is some of the best in any genre when it comes to maximizing your gameplay. Cotton Rock and Roll is no exception to this rule. It's probably one of the best in the genre that I've played in the last five years, and one which I'll probably buy again for the Nintendo Switch when I get the chance. Because it's the perfect type of game to just pick up and play around in. With a lot of different characters that actually play reasonably different, and an interesting magic and bullet system that can be very situational depending on the different enemy variations and locations, you have to adapt to each different level here and you really do notice how prior knowledge really helps in pushing you to do better and better. There's good levels of difficulty for both the new players in the genre while allowing the challenge for veterans in it. And it's all 
in a really colorful style that you don't want to take your eyes off of. I do love the goofy story that's present here, as the character expressions really remind me of one of my favorite anime series, Slayers. Not Demon Slayer, Slayers. I'm old, goddammit. The feel of your character is exactly right for the different levels and the boundaries here, as I felt that all the mistakes were definitely on me. And I really do love the multi-stage bosses present in some of the levels. Look, the footage that you've seen on screen in the last minute or two, that will tell you perfectly well if the game is right for you. If it looks like your jam, it is. It's everything that you see on screen and more. But if it doesn't, it still may be worth a try just to feel out. But mileage, there may vary. Finally, let's finish off with what is probably the game that I will recommend the most. Because, well, honestly, if I had to rate it right now, it'd probably be in the mid-90s in my scoring system. Not many games make it to that level for everyone, because, again, my enhancer system. The game? Grim Guardian's Demon Purge. Wait, no, Gal Guardian's Demon Purge. Gotta love trademark problems. But let me set the tone of the game. You play two sisters, and very much like Castlevania Portrait of Ruin, you can switch between the two. One of them uses powerful magical origami to create weapons to physically attack her enemies. A cool unique idea that actually makes a lot of sense for the type of shrine priestess you see in Japanese folklore. The other? Well, I'll just let her say it. Yes, the game may not be 100% serious, but you know what is? The fun you'll have in this. Like, a lot of fun. It's action platforming with an emphasis on smart combat and movement, with it being a cross between the original NES Castlevania, Mega Man, and Ninja Gaiden, specifically the Insta-Death Pits. And yes, that may trigger some of you, but don't worry. You don't lose a life right away, because you have your partner that can come and revive you, which can really actually be a little bit too powerful in single player, but I digress. Yes, this is a spin-off game of the Galgun series, which I actually do have a review of the original Galgun 6-7 years ago? Man, that was a long time ago. But it's not a Metroidvania unlike what the user-based tags say here at first. It's closer to Bloodstained Circle of the Moon, and it's one of the best I've ever played. Each sister has their own strengths, doing better in certain situations while not well in others. Yet each of them can get through all situations by themselves by the end of the game. The visuals and animation really bring life to the world, and it's something you'd expect out of the developers and Nick creates but still surprises me with the detail on the pixel art side of things. While some say the music is generic, I think it definitely complements the gameplay and it's something I didn't want to turn off. The controls are exactly what they need to be for the gameplay, and you could really see the level of effort put into the game with the Uzi sister, as you notice that certain levels and areas give you just enough height to attack enemies in a very small window, but only in the right place and spacing. A good selection of sub-weapons and alternate movement abilities help to reward smart thinking, or lead to comical situations, like throwing a bouncing grenade right over an enemy. For me, however, the game does a great job of hitting a pace for me to move through enemies and get through obstacles, but not be ridiculously easy in the same breath. The bosses are challenging, yet have greatly defined patterns, so they are fun to face, but not too frustrating, even if they are a little bit. I love trying to collect all the students that you need to find, usually making you go through a gauntlet of traps, or just use your abilities in a way you didn't before, or go back to a level with a new ability that you got. 
I love getting new abilities and experimenting with them in combat. I love the ridiculously over-the-top super attack that actually leads to showing part of the story elements in ways that makes me want to do it on every screen. I love the stupid story and the comedy here, even if some of it's grown worthy. But it's that classic platforming and action gameplay that seals the deal. How it just feels so right to play, and how it reminds me of the days of playing games like Strider, Castlevania, and even Shovel Knight. It's just fantastic. And maybe I'll fully review it one day, but don't wait on me. This is worth your money right now. Anyway, that's it for this video. And I want to get your feedback for those who are still watching the video at this point. Was it enough games? Was it enough information for you to make a decision? I will always give you the information that you need in the Discord, which it's in the description below, but I want your feedback, so leave it in the comment section below. Let me know if you want to see this more on a regular basis. Maybe for every month of games that I stream, I take a look at it. Now, you may be wondering, how will I know all the games that you stream? Well, I'm going to be calling out a certain someone here because she's been doing a lovely art project at this point. Granted, it needs to catch up a little bit, but there's a little collage that's happening in terms of the games that I've streamed that is being updated time and time again. It's my fiance, by the way, that's doing this artwork. And so while I won't show it here, I'll show it in the Discord. Again, giving you reason to actually join the Discord. A lot of shit happens there. You should go there. Coming up next on the channel is a review of Rough Justice 84. It's the game that I played on stream that I feel like is calling to me right now in terms of talking about it. It's the type of game that I want to play right now. It's a game that has style and it just feels like a game that hasn't gotten the coverage that I feel like it should. So I'll play it more and I'll let you guys know how the game is. Anyway, I will not be streaming for the next several days probably until maybe next Wednesday because I'm going on a little, I guess, mini vacation of sorts for the next couple of days. We'll be looking at wedding venues and just having a little bit of fun in St. Augustine. So that's it for now. And as always, keep on gaming.